Welcome back to the Compact Echo course. In the next few videos, we will talk about the apical views and we will start off with the apical four chamber view. Well, the apical views, they are located as it's already in the name at the apex of the heart. Especially you want to focus on the left ventricular apex. Keep in mind compared to the peristone views, you're way more lateral and of course more caudal. It will be in the range of the fifth intercostal space where you find the apical views, the apical four chamber view in this video especially. But keep in mind it's highly variable. The marker should point in the cardiac preset to the left lateral of the patient. The patient shouldn't be, compared to the peristernal views, not strictly in his left lateral position because you need a little bit of more space for the transducer on the lateral side. Alternatively, you just can remove a part that you can scan better, but we in our Ecolab, we simply do not place the patient strictly left lateral. The view overall is, as I said, highly variable. It is highly dependent on the body type. And of course, you should tilt the transducer towards the left ventricular apex to actually find the four chamber view. There are some problems, of course, when the patient is severely obese or slim patients as well, it could be hard to find an optimal or a good view. You can use contrast in those patients to optimize your image quality. In COPD patients, it can be sometimes hard to get peristernal or also apical views. And in case of breast implants, sometimes they are just in your field of view. So it's harder to scan those patients. The four chamber view, you can see that the marker is left lateral. Then with a rotational movement, you get to the two chamber view and the three chamber view, the also so-called apical long axis view. You rotate counterclockwise for those views, 60 to 90 degrees from the four chamber view to get to the two chamber view and 30 more degrees approximately to get to the apical long axis view. If you tilt the transducer to be more steep, I would say you can get the aortic valve and find the five chamber view. And if you tilt the other direction, so optimizing the view away from the aortic valve, it's called the coronary sinus view. In case of the four chamber view, well, it gives you the overview of all four cardiac chambers. The left ventricle seen over here has to be bullet shaped. Of course, the left ventricular wall should be thicker than the right ventricular wall. That's due to, of course, the pressure difference in those chambers. And of course, you have to find valves and valvular structures. So here's the mitral valve, the anterior, the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And here's the tricuspid valve, where you can differentiate the septal leaflet and here the anterior posterior leaflet. The left ventricle should be larger than the right ventricle. Overall, it should be two to one, but also keep in mind that there are simply differences in anatomy depending on the body shape and also what you will find when you're scanning the heart. And a very important point I want to state is that you should avoid foreshortening. We will discuss foreshortening in some later slides, but keep that word in mind when the ventricle is not scanned really directly at the apex, you have foreshortening and oversee some relevant pathologies. The left ventricle is a truncated ellipsoid. You see this bullet shape over here. You see the cavity of the left ventricle. The contractility of this left ventricle is fairly good. The ejection fraction is in the range of 55 to 60%, I would say. And you see that all walls are contracting quite nicely. This is a focused view of the left ventricle. So the atria, they are completely cut off. This gives you even the advantage that you see the ventricle in an optimal position. The geometry already can give you a lot of hints towards which pathology might be present. Here you have several examples of pathologies and we'll discuss all of them one after the other. So on the left hand side, you do see that's the normal left ventricle we have seen. We have the focused left ventricular view, the good contractility of the left ventricle. And on the right hand side, we do see a pathology. We do see a pathological finding. This is also a more focused view of the ventricle, so the atria cut off a little bit. You do see the right ventricle over here and the contractility of the right ventricular free wall. That's actually looking fairly good. The valves look 
also fairly okay. But there's a problem with the left ventricle. You do see that ejection fraction must be reduced because there are areas which are not contracting properly. Here you see there's a hinge point. So from that point on, we have a wall motion abnormality. That was an anterior STEMI, so an SD elevation myocardial infarction. And you see quite nicely that here the wall motion abnormality, the LED territory is differentiated compared to the here hypercontractile basal and mid segments due to the lack of the apex in contraction. Moving forward, we have another example we do see in this case, again, the normal heart. And here something looks entirely different. The walls of the left ventricle, they are thickened. This is a patient with severe hypertensive heart disease with remodeling. A remodeled left ventricle means that there's fibrosis present. You see that in this case, the walls are thicker, the cavity of the left ventricle compared to the normal variant over here is smaller. Ejection fraction is still in the normal or just marginally reduced range. I would have said the ejection fraction is around 50%, but even though ejection fraction is normal, this heart definitely is not normal. The left ventricle shows damage from hypertensive, long-standing severe hypertension. Moving on to the next patient. This is a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. You can see the full case in another video. You can get the link in the box over here. And you do see also it's distinctly different. The ventricle overall is larger compared to the one on the left hand side. The walls are really thin. You could think that there's also a wall motion abnormality here, but overall it's a severely reduced left ventricular function we can see here. Also compare the left heart, so here, with this heart on the right side. You do see that also the right ventricle is dilated and the function is definitely reduced. So this is a dilated cardiomyopathy after myocarditis. Another example I want to show you is a heart transplanted patient. You do see again that ejection fraction here compared to the example before is way better. It's, it is in the range of 60%. But what we can also appreciate is that the myocardium is thickened. A heart transplanted patient with a thickened myocardium always has to raise the doubt that there could be a transplant rejection present, which was actually happening in this case. You do see the thickened heart, but the good contractility. If we do look towards strain imaging, strain imaging already was markedly reduced. Compare it again with the left hand side, where you see the normal heart, but also a transplanted heart by means of the left ventricle should look like. So the walls should be not thickened. In this case, we have another patient with coronary artery disease. This is a patient after myocardial infarction, and you do see that here the parts of the septum, especially the basal and the mid portions of the left ventricle, they are very thin and hyperechoic. This is a scar, a coronary artery disease led to myocardial infarction, led to scarring, so remodeling of the ventricle. You do see that here is again a hinge point, so where the myocardium starts contracting better. And when you take a look over here, then in this area, again, we have no contractility. So here again is a scar. Here we do see the basal parts of the anterolateral wall. They are contracting, but here we also have scarred tissue. So always keep in mind that coronary artery disease after myocardial infarction can lead to scarring, which will present in a very bright, echogenic, thin myocardium. So it should be thinner than six millimeters in this area if it's really a transmural scar, which was actually the case in this patient. Moving on to something I truly like to perform, it's contrast. Contrast imaging gives a lot of detailed information about the heart. And in this case, the patient was a very young patient with formerly known uh, cardiomyopathy known as non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Nowadays, we call it hypertrabeculation of the left ventricle with heart failure. Her strain was reduced. Initially, ejection fraction was in the range of 20%, but with heart failure therapy, it improved significantly. As you can see here, in this case, it's around 
percent, and you do see those hypertrabeculations all over the place in the apical and also mid portions to a certain degree of this ventricle. Overall, the ventricle seems comparatively thin compared to this normal example, and you do see that the walls are now dark. So the cavity is filled with the bubbles over here, and that's why you can see those trabeculations, that there are no thrombi present, that it is really a ejection fraction in this range of 45%. With contrast, it's simply easier and it gives a lot of additional information and it makes the detection, and that's also important with hypertrabeculation of thrombi, easier. Moving on to the next case, this is a case of a so-called apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You do see here the whole cavity is not yet filled with the contrast, but you can nicely see the contrast in the apex. And what you can appreciate is that there is no aneurysm. So in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, with patients where you do not see the walls properly, where you do not can estimate the ejection fraction when the hypertrabeculation is present, I would always recommend to use contrast imaging. Because with contrast, you can way better delineate that there, in this case, there is no aneurysm, if there would be an aneurysm of a certain size, about 15 millimeters, anticoagulation actually is mandatory in those patients. So you can see that here the heart fills and even up to the apex where we see the most hypertrophied segments in this apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, also called the Yamaguchi syndrome. You do not see thrombi, you do not see an aneurysm. And again, contrast gives a lot of additional information. Overall, ejection fraction is normal in this patient. Of course, due to the hypertrophy, also parts of the ventricle are simply smaller, so even the ejection fraction can be overestimated compared to the true left ventricular function which is present. 